And until we have any real questions, Robert, I can kick it off with a question. Um, in your, uh, let's see, in one of your books, you said, it's sad to see someone always on to the next thing while this moment goes unnoticed. And I was wondering if that relates to smartphones, if you see people on their smartphones and you have that kind of thought or feeling. Oh, the worst thing about the phones is the way that people um, consult them while walking in a busy sidewalk, which throws the thing off for everyone. There was just a, a video I saw a couple of days ago that was a test that some people did. They had two converging uh, groups of people in a narrow um, passageway. And when the people were not looking at their phones, they passed each other perfectly, no problem. If they had only two people, one in each group, consulting a phone, the entire thing went crazy and people were bouncing off the walls. So that's the one, being an old New Yorker, the last time I went back there, walking around in uh, central Manhattan was just terrible, just terrible. You had to be dancing around all the time to avoid being hit by someone walking right at you. And the, of course, driving while consulting the phone is, is nuts, absolutely nuts. Because when you are looking at that screen, there is no time. You're just totally absorbed. There's no sense of time passing at all. And um, you might look at your cell phone thinking it's only one second and end up hitting someone head on. So I hope people don't do that, at least not while I'm driving. <laughs> so all these people and no questions, eh? Well, I'm not going to give a talk, I refuse. <laughs> Okay. I have a question. Hi. Hi. Um, I'd like to know uh, what does time and space uh, have to do with our um, present time and relevant to what we are doing uh, at that present time? Oh, that's a wonderful question. That's a really deep question. Um, we don't really know what time is. Um, if, if you look at this naturalistically, the human brain evolved. Well, there's good evidence for that from beginning with one-celled creatures that were somewhat conscious of their surroundings. We've evolved these brains that are exquisitely adapted to living in the world. So the world that we see is not necessarily reality, but it's a presentation that the brain has learned to make from the various inputs, from the visual input, auditory input, tactile input, messages from the internal organs, all kinds of things. Um, we're finding out now that the human nervous system is sensitive to magnetic fields. Um, so that's there. So all of this, we have to realize that the brain has no contact, direct contact with the outside world, but only through these inputs, through the optical nerves and the auditory nerves. It's just encased in the brain in the dark. Mm -hmm. And so it has learned, evolved to construct a world that we see that will foster survival. We recognize fruit on a tree because we need to eat fruit in order to survive. So that's, that's now the, the sensation of time is like that. We have, a, we, we have evolved to see things sequentially, which may not really be sequential, but it serves our survival needs to see them as sequential. I'll, I'll give you a, an example of that. If I 
touch my toes. And this comes from a professor, David Eagleman, who do, who's a, a neuro researcher, a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. If I touch my toes, it takes a fraction of a second for that nerve impulse to get from the toe to the brain and to be perceived as a touch. The taller you are, the longer it takes. And it's not a very brief interval. It's actually a sizable amount of time. It's a fraction of a second, but it's measurable. If you touch your nose, that signal will get to the brain much faster because it's right there. It doesn't have to travel the length of the body electrically. However, if someone touches you on the toe and the nose at the same, at, if, at the same time, you will not perceive a difference. Al although there is a difference in the way that those signals strike the brain, the brain learns to account for that difference and to make it seem simultaneous because that serves our need. The body is touched simultaneously, so we need to perceive it that way. And therefore, we are always living in the past because the brain has learned to wait for about a tenth of a second to make sure that no distant signal that should be included in the present, in the so-called present, has arrived. We're, we're always living a fraction of a second behind. What we perceive as the present is really the past. In order to present a world that's coherent and works, we have to allow a time lapse so that the brain can put together these signals that arrive differently at different times into the coherent present. So there really is no present that we can experience as humans except the trick of the brain. Another good example of this is um, if you're watching a video, maybe on YouTube, sometimes you'll see that the voice is not in sync with the mouth. That's mm -hmm. noticeable. But that's because, that's because the voice and the image are too far apart but they don't have to be right together to, to perceive it in, in sync. There can be a difference of about a 10th of a second. Within that 10th of a second field, the brain will make this adjustment and, and put it in sync. It will, it will make you imagine that the, that the voice and the moving mouth is the same, and it really isn't. So time is a construction of of the human brain. Oh. I don't know if I made this clear. Yes, yes, I understand perfectly. Uh, but that brings me to another question. Um, so in reality, it nothing exists unless I can perceive it. Um, nothing exists as far as you know unless you can perceive. time and space according to time and space well it's it's a very big jump and i think an unwarranted jump to say that nothing exists unless you perceive it that's what you call solipsism you make yourself the the, the center of reality but are you no well so then yes that's a good answer so 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 then how can it be that, that nothing exists unless we perceive it? We don't know what exists. Because everything, ha as you explained, everything happened in, within a fraction of a second in the past. Yes, but, but, but the point there, um, the point there is that um, we don't know what's out there. The brain is locked in the skull. It doesn't have eyes and ears. It gets these signals and it has evolved to use those signals to navigate around biologically to eat and, and mate and protect itself from injury and all of this. We've learned to do this. This has evolved over countless eons, really. And 
it leaves us with a human point of view, but no way to know what reality is. We have no way of knowing that. And that's my critique of all the spiritual teaching. The spiritual teachers are always yammering about reality and what's real and isn't real. They don't know. They don't have the slightest idea. It's all made up. All of it. It's entirely made up. And it's like a joke to me, but I see they get so serious about it and they want to debate or they want to sit there in splendid robes and lecture people about reality. And really, uh, it's a fool's errand they're on, in my view, completely foolish. Okay, I got it. Thank more, you. No more questions? Um, I have to ponder a little bit because that, um, then I have a, where does this con consciousness comes in that I have to uh, realize or I have, whatever the name is, I use consciousness, but not necessarily that. Yeah. Then I, where is that? What, do, what is that that I have to know? Yes. I think what you have to know is that we don't know what any of this is. <laughs> we don't know what any of this is. It's really simple. We know what we know as, as humans, but a human is not the standard of reality for, for the universe or whatever. We're just these primate animals living on a planet. There are probably many other countless planets with life forms on them. That's what scientists believe now. And somehow, we've become so inflated that we imagine that the human being is the measure of all things. Right. And we are not. We're not even, we may not even be the most intelligent animal on this planet. There's some, ev <laughs> there's some evidence that whales um, may have more brain power than humans. They just don't show it because they don't need to work to make a living. They don't need to invent things. They don't need to build, build things. They're living in a perfect environment. They're living in a womb. They have no enemies. If they want food, they just open their mouth and swim through a school of fish or shrimp or whatever it is that they want to eat. And, uh, but apparently they have a language. They sing to one another. They have complex sex lives with families and mating and all of this the way that we do. And um, I have a feeling that humans are too big for their britches. <laughs> and I think that's what we, in, in, in my understanding of what it means to be awake, that's how I understand it. That you see that you have a human point of view you always will, and that one day you're going to die. And that's just the flow of life. And there's no reason to invent all these fairy stories about God and heaven and, and uh, transcendence and uh, perfect masters and all the rest of this garbage. And that's been my message for the last few years. Uh, and I'm really happy to be an advocate for it. There's very few of us at the moment. Very few. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that, that's a very good, those are very good questions that you ask, you know. Thank you. Remember that. <laughs> that, that person doesn't know. They're just talking. They don't know what anything is. We don't. We, we, we have evolved to construct a world from these inputs. So what we're seeing is a kind of movie that the brain makes in order to walk around without bumming in, bumping into things, in order to find what's good to eat, in order to find a mate, in order to care for our children, whatever it is. It, it all works, it evolved. And if you understand Darwin, what works continues and what doesn't work drops off. So what we have is a very finely tuned 
system of illusion. And we're living in that illusion. We're living in a world that seems solid, although we know very well from science that there's vast spaces between the molecules in this thing, but I don't perceive that. I don't perceive it because that will not help me to live. What I need to know is that things are solid and if you bump into them, you'll get hurt. Not look at them and see there's vast space in there, you see, and I can just walk through the wall. No, you can't. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. <laughs> Who wants to be tortured next? Uh, I see that Alango has his hand raised. He, uh, he can go ahead. Okay. That's good. Are you there? I yeah. Hi, Alango. Hello, Robert. How are you? I'm well, thank you. And you? I'm fine, thank you. Robert, just to clarify, I've read, I've read your books. So just for a clarification, uh, do you uh, post as that you are a teacher or a speaker of life? Well, I, so that I, can. I would never call myself a teacher because I don't really have anything to teach. What I... Okay. What I, what I experience is that I had a kind of a breakthrough a long time ago that gave me a point of view that seems unusual. But I'm not the only okay. one who has it. it. I'm not the only one who has it. But when I say unusual, I mean, it's not that common. And since that happened, when people ask me questions, the answers just arise. I'm not, I don't have any sense that the answer is coming from Robert. If you ask me a question, I just speak. I, I, I don't feel that I'm constructing any answer. And that's why I don't, don't have anything to teach. I mean, unless there's a question, there's no, there's no activity. Uh, what was the uh, a shift which happened before and after? which makes you what you are now, a bit different from us. What, I, I, I didn't follow that, you're asking. The shift, the shift, the shift. Yeah, well, I, I hear people call that a shift. I, I don't really like that term because this is here right now. It's not that you shift somewhere else. It's here right now, but we've been trained from childhood not to notice it because the culture doesn't want us to notice it. It wants us to be doers and to be good citizens and follow the yellow brick road and get your life insurance and all the rest of it. They don't want you to sit there and say, I'm not doing this, but that's a fact. Nobody's really doing anything. I mean, we have doings, but they don't arise from any center there. It's the entire the entire flow of, of life is the doer, not the individual human, as I see it. But this was not the case before a certain event happened in your life. That's true. Uh, That's true. I noticed, I, but you see, it wasn't a shift. It was just something I noticed it, within my ordinary life. It's not like lightning hit me and I, there was this great transformation or something. I was just sitting there in my pickup truck looking out at the landscape in a very beautiful place. I was parked on the edge of the Rio Grande Gorge, which is a beautiful place in New Mexico. And I'd been there many times, it was my home. And I'm just sitting there, you see, and looking out into the distance. And then it was like a voice spoke to me, but it wasn't a voice, but it was like a voice in my mind. And I thought, I'm not doing this, I'm not, I didn't make that gorge and I didn't make Robert. It's all, it's all happening together. It's all one, it's all one gesture. And the sense of myself that I've been trained to have, you have your ID card and you're responsible and you have to feel shame when you do the wrong thing and all of this kind of stuff. That was an overlay. It was like a grid that had been put on life. And that just dropped away for a moment. And I just saw, saw things in a different way. I saw myself as a happening, not as a doer. 
Yes. So can, can I can I say that uh, after that event, uh, the INS in you dropped something, the sense of doership. Yeah, but it 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 took it took several years. It was very painful. Um, things that I had relied on doing because I was motivated to do them, a lot of the motivation left, and um, I found myself really struggling because I had a career and I kept on doing it, but it felt more and more not connected to what I was really feeling. There was a lot of suffering, psychological suffering involved, I would say, for several years until I could somehow find out how to be an ordinary human again. Uh, it's hard so, to explain. Yeah. So those num after the number of years, then did that I collapse totally now, as of now, the INS of doing things like which we have. Well, it's hard to know. It's hard for me to know what you mean by INS. I certainly have a sense of being a, a person. I mean, here I am. I wake up in the morning and I have my point of view. I have my home, not not someone else's house. I've got donkeys that I own. I own them and I take care of them. But yes, I do not have a sense of some kind of firm myself that continues through time. I don't really have that sense. And but this happened after a couple of years, as you were telling us. Maybe about six or seven years until the whole thing really gelled so that I could continue living in an ordinary way and still honor this understanding or this point of view. It, it's, it was a period of adjustment or of, and during that time, I, I had never been that much of a spiritual seeker before this happened. I mean, I was familiar with the same stuff that other my friends read, but I, I didn't go to India, no project to be enlightened, none of that. I wasn't on that track. But after this happened, I read a number of accounts of other people's awakenings and other, other books to try to understand what had happened to me. That's when I hit on UG Krishnamurti. That was he was very his writing was very helpful to me, because apparently what happened to him was similar to my experience, not the same, but in the, in the ballpark. And um, I looked into a lot of it for a few years. I read I read on the science of the nervous system and read some spiritual books. Um, and now I don't anymore. I don't really have any interest in that. I so think... I gather that, yeah, please, yeah, please. Go, no, please, please go ahead. Uh, that uh, prior to the event happening, the awakening, you were not a seeker as such, and you could not label that you did, you did a certain thing and you got the awakening. That couldn't be said, a cause-effect relationship. Oh, well, it's not that simple. Um, I, I was aware of the work of George Gurdjieff, and had read um, his books, and that influenced me. That influenced me. Shut off my phone here. Okay, sorry. Um, so I'm talking about George Gurji. I yeah, I was aware of this system that Gurji taught about the three centers of the body, and trying to get those three centers into alignment. And I'd worked with that a little, but I don't think that accounts for the experience I had. I don't think it was important. I know it's very tempting to try to say this, you, he, he followed this method for a while and look what happened, he, he awakened. But I don't, I, I can't say that's what happened. You said uh, from the initial time of awakening till for about six to seven years, there was a time of adjustment. Yeah. Where there was suffering, where there was suffering. Had been total like now. Has the suffering gone from your life? Um, well, there's still physical suffering. I mean, I wake up in the morning. I broke my back uh, a couple of years ago, and it still hurts when I get out of bed in the morning. Um, I, I woke with a headache today. That seems to 
have passed. So there's that kind of suffering is there. And sometimes I feel a tremendous sadness um, when I see the way that we humans are living in general. Um, if I contemplate it, I can start to cry, actually. I don't know if you call that suffering or not. Empathy, a sort of empathy. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's empathy. And empathy, empathy is suffering. Empathy is you're standing in someone else's shoes, not just pretending that you're standing in their shoes. You actually feel what it would be like. To so be is that suffering? Yes. But the psychological suffering has gone, which was there prior to the awakening as well, the, Robert as a human being. The kind of suffering that I see a lot of people in, are affected by, I don't have that suffering. Uh, for example, a lot of people are really worried about dying. They don't want to die. They're afraid to die. They don't want myself to come to an end. Or what if I go to hell? All these, that's a kind of suffering that doesn't touch me at all. If I if, and Robert, even you had it prior to the awakening, the suffering. E even I had the same type of human suffering before the awakening happened. Of course, we're all just human here. We we, we suffer. We're animals. Animals suffer, and we have large brains that can not just a lot of the lower animals. I call them lower. I should, that's not right. On some, on some other branches of the tree, there are animals that have big brains, but there's not that much evidence that they think and have ideas. The brain is used to navigate and to collect food and mate and all this. We have, seem to have a little extra brain power that can be used to try to figure out our circumstances. And that really seems to uh, mess a lot of people up. So can I ask you, Robert, that now, let's say that uh, on an average, say 99%, 99.99% of the human population lives like what I am doing or what Robert was doing prior to the awakening in the realm of suffering because of this human brain. Due to the destined evolutionary pathway, we have uh, sort, of, sort of misutilized it. That is why you say that empathy of, of looking at the humans and suffering a uh, type of uh, sadness comes to you. Yes. which implies that uh, you know the human life is not the correct way of life. Can I say that uh, people like you who have had the awakening or certain people use different terminologies, enlightenment, shift, et cetera, et cetera. You have transcended that human realm of suffering into another realm of existence. Inside the body, inside the same brain, something has shifted for the software, the awareness where you have transcended that human level. It, it's, it's sort of metaphorical. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far, really. I, I think I think it's just a slightly different point of view that I have, and I think other people have it too. I meet them. There, it's yeah, just, but it is a very minuscule part of the population. It's I think point zero 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 one percent. Well, and what we are looking. I'm sorry. Continue. Now, what we are looking for, like especially people like me who, are, who call ourselves as seekers in spirituality for years together. We have tried different methods, et cetera. And we, we are looking at, as an, as an inspiration, people like you who, with methods or without methods, have reached that maybe a very small shift, but like uh, uh, what uh, you know, the guy who went onto the moon said, a small step for me, but a giant leap for mankind. So you are probably one of the uh, precursors or predecessors of the human evolution if it goes on the right path, that others human can have the slight shift and go away from suffering which appears to be the major part of our human life because with so much of plentiness in the earth now, there is no dearth of food or money or any material things which we had earlier centuries. But even now human beings are suffering with all these things. So we are looking at you to some sort of guidance that we can follow to achieve the state that you are in. But even if it is minuscule, it, it matters a lot to us. But ultimately at the end of the day, I want to be free of suffering. Yeah, I, well, I understand that. Ilango. The thing is that there have been these teachers and gurus for many centuries, for 
thousands of years, really. I mean, we know we go we can go back 3,000 years and see all this talk. And if that was going to work, it should have worked by now, but it doesn't work. Listening to all that doesn't seem to get through to anyone. What I see the, the listeners to these gurus, to me, they don't seem awake, they seem hypnotized. They seem, they, they imagine that someone like me really knows everything and can just explain it all and then you'll be enlightened too. And it doesn't work that way. It's not something that can be explained. It's an experience. It's just an experience. It's, you, you might have it in the next second to just notice that you are not creating this reality. It's, it, it's you're part of it. You see, this can't be put into words adequately. I don't feel that I'm answering your question. I feel that your question is being answered, but not by Robert. These words are just coming. I don't know where they come from. If I look, I can't find where, where are they coming from? They're just out my mouth. We've been trained to say, I said it, I spoke. These are my ideas. See, but I don't feel that way. And that's- Robert is just instrument. Not even an instrument. I don't know. See, I don't know. I don't know what we are, really. So uh, can we say that, you know, this body mind is mysterious and it is part of a cosmic software. A program is happening and things are happening by themselves in terms of computers. Uh, yeah, well, I, I would caution you against using computers as as the metaphor. You see, this, this happens in every, in every um, epoch, epoch of the industrialization. Whatever the, whatever the technology is at that time is used as the metaphor for how the brain works or how the, what the, like in Freud's day, hydraulics were the big thing, steam engines and all this, hydraulics. So his theory of the human, mind was hydraulic. There's pressures building up over here and then this releases the pressure and then pressure builds up again. It was all hydraulic. I don't think the human brain is a computer. I don't think it works like a computer. I think it works in a very different way as I understand this. Um, I mentioned David Eagleman before. I've been picking up on his stuff lately. He doesn't think the brain works like a computer either. Um, he imagines it as an organic organ that's constantly um, reshaping itself second by second. And uh, computers don't work that way. So, you know, I, I, I really understand the source of your questions. I do. I understand that you have this yearning. I do get that from you because we've spoken before and I've read your comments and see that you are interested in some other people who speak about these things. And there's this feeling, if I could only just get this, this one thing, see, then I would be relieved. But th this is so hard to put into words. You are that right now. It's just not noticed. It goes unnoticed because something else is more attractive. The idea of becoming is more attractive than the idea of just being what you are. For all of us, we, I mean, I, I remember years ago when I was starting my photography career, all I wanted to do was be a famous photographer. If I had known then what I know now, I would have been so happy to just have a camera and be a photographer. A young man with a beautiful, strong body and a camera and walking around in the world, beautiful. What more could you really ask for? And so at the time, if someone had said, are you satisfied, Robert? I would say, no, I'm not. I want a big show over here. I want my stuff published. I want, and you see, this would all be depressing. It would all be weighing heavily on the actual enjoyment of life.
which is not that you become famous, but that you have a camera at all and can walk around in the world using it and seeing things. Now that I'm retired and I don't care about my photography career, I let that go long ago. When I go out with a camera, it's a real joy, much better than it ever was when I was really trying to make something happen. So there, that, I think that's a fair metaphor. The way you are now is beautiful. You will never be this young again. You will never have this opportunity that you have right now. It, it, they, it doesn't keep coming up. It's, it's now or never. And I think when we grasp that deeply, that may, that may do it. Not that Robert can explain anything to you. I can't. I don't, I don't know anything that you don't know. I don't. Robert, uh, you were telling that you feel a sadness looking at human beings, the way they live. Yes, it's horrible. So what would you like the human beings to change? They can't. This is it. Nothing. But that, you feel sad about it, right? That's right. I'm, I, we're animals and we're violent animals. We are violent animals. That's why there's always wars everywhere because we're violent. When we see other animals fighting, we understand they're violent. They can't change. So but what is the sadness you have? The sadness is that I'm not violent anymore, but I have been. And I wish that we weren't the way we are, I guess. You know, it's, it's just sad for me to see how much suffering, bombs falling on babies. Come on, why? It's terrible. You see, and the so-called the so-called enlightened person isn't supposed to feel any of that. They just say, oh, well, that's the way it is, you know. Well, I understand that. That's the way it is, but that I don't feel good about it. Why should I? Robert, you've written these beautiful books. I mean, is there a purpose behind it to educate the human beings? The books. I wrote two books. I guess you've read yeah. both of them. Yeah. Here's, here's what happened in Longo. Years ago, my friend Robert Hall, who's now deceased, is a well-known Buddhist teacher, and he and I used to get together weekly to discuss various matters. And one day he said to me, you know, you are a teacher of non-duality. You really should be doing that, not just sitting here talking to me. And I let that sink in for a couple of years. And um, I started to feel he's right. This is a bit selfish. I have something to share. I have a point of view that people seem to want to know about. I'm going to do that. So I started talking about it and it didn't go well. Um, people came to see me like a, a kind of guru. And um, I found that I was talking a lot of bullshit. I wasn't lying, but I was just using other, other people's ideas and words because I couldn't really penetrate into my own experience and express it. So that first book, The 10,000 Things was, so I stopped doing the, the guru bit and went back to just being myself. And then John Troy got me on Facebook. He interviewed me and got me on Facebook. And once I was on Facebook, I entered into these conversations for a couple of years. And there was just so much bullshit. I mean, I could hardly stand it. And then um, I found myself writing a book, which I, I had, well, I've, I've left something out in long ago. The important point is that after trying to be a guru for a year, which didn't work, and listening to all this bullshit on Facebook, I decided I have to just be completely honest. If I'm going to speak about these things, I've got to be honest. I have to, I, I, I won't lie. I won't, I won't make things up. I won't leave things out. And that's how that book came to be. 
And apparently it worked because I get letters almost every day from people who say this book changed my life. Well, that wasn't the intention. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. I didn't say I'm going to write this book that will change people's lives. I just wanted to express yeah. myself honestly. What was the difference as a speaker you had made as made some mistakes which you corrected as a writer? That, that's what I gather from what you're talking to me. That's right. That, that's what was a, that mistake which you corrected? It's an attitude that that needed correction. The attitude that I came that when I started when when Robert Hall told me you have this obligation, I took it personally in a in a bad way and thought, oh well, now I have to perform. You know, I have to people will come to me and they'll ask me questions and I'll explain everything. So now what I the way I look at that now is that that was really foolish because I don't have that to give. What I have to give is what I'm doing now, which is just speaking as honestly as I can about my experience. I'm not saying, oh, I felt feel embarrassed that all that happened or whatever. It's not like that. It's just right now we're speaking and whatever comes to my out of my mouth comes out of my mouth. I'm there. Okay. You asked a question before, what's the difference between between me and just like a seeker? I'm not sitting there judging myself at all. That's gone away entirely, entirely. I don't judge myself. I don't say, oh, you did a bad thing or isn't this thing you did wonderful, Robert? What a great guy you are. There's none of that, none of it. I'm not proud and I'm not ashamed, just am. As the separation ceased, the doership that you are doing. Yes, there's no sense of that. No sense. And are you are you always most of the time uh, in a state of uh, uh, in a state of unknown joy? There is no reason for you to be happy, but you're happy. Well, I am pretty happy. And compared to the shift earlier, compared to the earlier human life. Well, I was yeah, I was I wasn't un exactly unhappy when I was younger, but there was a lot of stress and worries and the, the need for self-improvement. And I don't have that. If, I, if I'm cooking, I cook every night. I'm the, I'm the main chef around here. And um, when I cook, it's, I just enjoy chopping onions, you know? Someone said to me, why don't you get a food processor? You're doing the same thing every night, chop, chop, chop. I don't want a food processor. I like chopping onions. I even like washing dishes. Although some people say that's crazy, but I like it. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, from what I gather from your talks, your books and you know, uh, what you have been speaking, is it that yeah, I understand that after the shift, there is no robot speaking and there is no Ilango listening. It is just happening. Everything is happening by itself. Is that the bottom line? No, I hear that all the time. That's not really true. You, you exist for me as a, as a, as a separate person. I, I know, see, I don't know you well, but we have been carrying on for a couple of years now. I know, I know things about you. I know, I know, you know, you live in Indonesia, right? Am I right there? India, India. India, India. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. So I had that wrong, but you, you live in India. I know that about you. There's a cultural milieu that applies to you that doesn't apply to me, just as you're not an American, you know, um, or a Mexican. I'm, I'm both now, apparently. Passports say that anyway but I'm really an American. I was born and raised there. I have all those hidden little gems. <laughs> so I, I consider you a, a person, a human being. I'm not one of these spiritual teachers who say the person doesn't really exist. That's nonsense. Like, like, like Jim Newman, example. Yeah, Jim Newman and I had a really great conversation because Unlike some people, I don't think that he's full of shit. I think he's describing an actual experience that he had, but I think he's using an, an unfortunate vocabulary that he inherited 
from um, Parsons. Tony Parsons. Yeah. Tony Parsons, yeah. And if he didn't use that vocabulary and spoke more just plain English, I think a lot of people would recognize that he actually is awake in that sense. So there is a, a, a difference between what you say and you know Jim Newman, Tony Parson group of spiritual teachers where they say there is no one speaking to no one. But you say it is Robert speaking to Ilango, but it is happening by itself. What, what I say is we don't know what anything is. So how can Tony Parson say this doesn't exist, that doesn't exist, that never happened? How, where is he standing to, to, to be able to say that? I, I consider that I'm in, awake, and, and I, I, don't, I can't say things like that. I would be lying if I, if I see, that's when I, when I was telling you I had this time as, as the guru thing, I would say things like that, but they weren't mine. I said them because it's a lot of pressure when someone starts asking you questions, you know, you want an answer to give, and so you draw it from somewhere. I came to the end of that. I came to the place where I realized I'm going to die. What the fuck? Might as well be honest and just tell it like it is. And then, and, and some people hate me for that. Not maybe not hate. They, I get, I get some bad mail. <laughs> okay, Robert, you are different. Just to, again, you know, to clarify. So you accept Robert Salzman is there with a the body mind. You accept Ilango is there. You are an American. I am an Indian with yes. different cultural milieus. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference that, you know, the human population thinks about and you are different? The thing is, you think we are all doing this automatically, like a software, cosmic software? Well, I'm just to be clear, I have this point of view, but I'm not alone in seeing things this way. There are other people on this planet. They may, yes, be, yes. They may be unusual, but I'm not, I'm not like this one the one, the one out of billions of people who has this point yeah. of view. And so Jim Newman and Tony Parsons, they have a, maybe have a different point of view. I'm not saying they're wrong. I, I'm just saying I can't speak that way. I can't tell you nothing, nothing ever happened. I would never say that. Plenty of things happened. Uh, you know, the World War, yeah, yeah. II, World War II happened. <laughs> My last birthday happened. People came here, you know, and we... We, we drank wine and laughed. Now, now, now there is a pandemic happening. <laughs> yes, that's right. And there, that's right. And, and, there, and instead of saying the way that the spiritual teachers like to say, oh, well, you know, God will take care of it. It's all love. No, there are people who are working on vaccines and getting the vaccines distributed and injecting them into arms and all that. I can have more respect for that kind of activity than I can some guy sitting on a throne with people kissing his feet. That, that, to me, Richard, I'm clear on that. Another thing, uh, ultimately, do you accept that you, I, the planets, the sun, the star, the galaxies, everything, atoms, quarks, they're all from the same energy source. There is only one thing in the universe manifesting as the many. Do you accept that or you think it is a hypothesis? I think it's a hypothesis. I, I, no one is situated so as to know that. To take an extreme case, we could be a brain in a vat with some mad scientists giving us all these perceptions that we, that we think refer to a world when there is no, that scientist is living in a world, but not the world that he makes us see. You're, it, you're talking of a simulation, right? What, I, what I'm saying is that people who pontificate about God, love, oneness, one energy drives the whole thing, they, where are they standing so that they can see all that? I can't see that. I, don't, I can't see it. I can think it. Sure, someone can make an argument for oneness and I can follow their train of thought and say, yeah, you know, I could see how someone could, could uh, believe that. What is your take on consciousness and awareness? Consciousness. Do you believe in consciousness? Well, it's hard to, hard to deny that. I mean, we are conscious. Uh, it's not that I believe in it. We're, obviously, we're conscious. I mean, if right. I do this, you hear it. 
it's your conscious richard you you after richard hall told you to write a book and you transformed yourself from a human being into a sort of a guru and then you changed your mistakes you became a writer me as another human being was still suffering what would what do you, what i am i'm not even asking you as an advice you've written two books and you're getting a lot of people uh, saying that things are helping uh, what would you sort of like us to take as the message from the book to change our lives or whatever i'm not even asking for a solution just as a human being to another human being you've written two books and after reading the books what do you feel we should give give up you mean violence we should give up or uh, the attitude what would be your sharing uh, i i i think if you want my advice um yeah i think it's best to stop believing in metaphysics of any kind just your those that's made up there's no knowledge in it all these india has a long tradition vedas you upanishads purport to explain reality although there is one verse where they say maybe maybe god doesn't even know you know that you know about that verse in the upanishads there's i i can't i can't quote it but who knows how this all got here nobody knows maybe god doesn't even know so that's this one element of doubt that was put in the upanishads but other than that it's a long text that purports to explain reality i wouldn't say those books should be burned but i think it's best to just read them skeptically and keep asking yourself and you know that how and how do you know that see and then there there there'll be various stories god gave it you know this was given from the big guy or yeah yeah yes really that sounds like a made up story to me i think someone wrote that shit and said i was in yeah. it's like moses went to the mountain and got the seven the 10 commandments really god spoke to him see though uh, to me that's a, that's a sounds made up so what would be your advice apart from the upanishads and vedas what would be robert salzman my, my advice is to stop thinking about spirituality and think about being a human and not not oh, but, not and not making this into something better it's oh, not okay robert i got it one uh, another thing see uh people like to, uh, the vedas they talk about the universal power the uh, human soul the cosmic soul the connection called as yoga blah blah that is one theory the next theory came with tony parsons who said nobody is speaking to nobody and there is nothing to be done but from you i get, i gather it is like there is a human being with a body mind but the message is understand that you are not doing it you are not having a life life is having you i mean is that a message i can take take home Yeah, on that, on that on that point of view, you're not having a life, you are a life. This is life. These are these are these bodies are alive. There's not some little little guy inside the body that has a body and has a life. The whole thing is life. And I think you don't accept free will then. Accept which? Free will, free will. Free will. Uh if if you think there's free will if you do just create the elongo that you wish you had and be done with it what does <laughs> robert salzman think does robert think there is a free will i think i wake up in the morning and the world is already here and i have to deal with it <laughs> so the answer is no you know i i don't want to say yes or no because whatever i say someone will be able to make a good argument for the for the opposite it's it's a foolish question unless you first under, go into what is will and what would it mean to have free will would uh, this will be my last answer to your questions because there's other people here but i know i know that i know that probably suppose, thank you suppose you i i i think this is in one of my books pretty pretty sure it is Suppose I say here's a vanilla ice cream cone or a chocolate one which would you like you have the free will to choose am i right yeah 
Most people would say that. I just decide, yes. I decide freely. There's no coercion. I decide yes. freely which one and I take it. Now you take the chocolate one. Okay. Now you come to me to discuss free will. And I say, well, Ilango, why did you choose the chocolate one? And you say, because I like chocolate and I don't like vanilla. And I say, oh, really? Well, when did you decide to like chocolate? You understand? You never did. Your likes and dislikes just come upon you like fate. Or you were trained by your family. Not a decision. I mean, you're given food when you're six months old. And that's the food you, it's Indian food for you. And for me, it's American food. And that's, yes. Okay. Pleasure to see you. I'm sure it won't be. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very good to see you, Ilango. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Goran is next. Okay. And I see Nigel, you have your hand up. We'll get to it. Good to see you. All right, Goran, you have something for me? Hi, Robert. Nice to meet you again. It's good to see you Thank again. Thank you too, for it. Very nice. Yeah. This is great. We're yes. having a small meeting here, so. Yeah, it's really nice, and I like it a lot. And, and thank you for doing this. And, and um, it's like the, the question I wrote to you yesterday, uh, and now it's twisted a bit more about it. But, but you know, what finally realized a few weeks ago, like reading your books and, and listening to you and Jim, and, and somehow it dawned on me that this is it, you know. And it's happening right now. And it couldn't happen anything else than right now. It's now it is. And somehow I, I realized that how could there be a, a fixed self when there is a now? Because then it would be that's shifting the whole time. It's like I'm a different person. But anyway, I have some kind of essence of Yaran. But I'm shifting, you know, it's like uh, somehow it's feel, I don't understand either anymore why it's called spirituality, because for me, it feels just ordinary, but ordinary, easy somehow. We don't know what anything is. So it's a mystery, but there is a sense of self that we all have that's different from the next person's sense of self. Where what, what's what you were calling an essence. Mm. There's, I mean, I'm speaking to you now, Robert is speaking. You can't just take any other citizen and put him in this chair and have the same conversation. It won't be the same. And I'm not the same when I speak to you as I was when I was speaking with Ilango. Mm. I noticed that. It's simple. I've got one, one account with Ilango and another one with you. And so it's subtle. That, that, that's our actual lives. See, the idealists want to erase all that and say it's all just one consciousness. I'm not too sure about that. It could be that each animal is conscious because it has a brain. And the consciousness is not coming from outside anywhere. There is no great field of consciousness and we're all just these little objects floating around in it, which is what the idealists are trying to say, or nothing really exists is what they say, but consciousness. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have no way of processing that. I can't decide if that's true or false. On, on what evidence? No evidence. And, and Robert, I, it's, it seems like all like the spiritual people want to sell some something in the future that I will attain something later on. It's like I was invited to a group mm -hmm. and, and uh, they are they should speak and then the the 
they were talking about the absolute and i don't understand what the absolute should be that that this is is there a final state or is it for me this is it it's happening now so how could i in a few minutes if it hasn't happened yet be more spiritual evolved or more enlightened than than this this mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. well you use the word sell they're trying to sell this idea that's a great product because when you promise something for the future but get paid for it now that's mm. an ideal business mm. now you say pay me now and in the future you will be enlightened like me it's yeah. perfect yeah. it's perfect because the future yeah. never comes and they don't they can't come back to you and say i followed the instructions i paid you the, all these thousands of dollars and i'm not enlightened then they say, you have to wait, you have to study more, you have to meditate more, you have to, whatever the, whatever the so-called path is, you're not done yet, but I've paid you. But, well, but <laughs> you have to keep going, pay me again. See, it's a perfect, it's a perfect business and it's corrupt. It's, I'm not, it's, I, I'm, wait, just let me put in a, a disclaimer here. I am not saying that anyone who ever discussed spirituality is corrupt that's not my point the business is corrupted it's like it's like being a rock star now they sell tickets they have these events where you have to pay gobs of money to just sit there and listen to somebody talk i'm just mm -hmm. talking now send money <laughs> <laughs> But, but and also how could you sell this how is it possible to sell when, when everything is happening right now what i seems to be to me uh, that everything all over the world is happening right now in this moment how could you sell this um pt the great pt barnum once said no one ever went bust underestimating the intelligence of the public and that's the answer. There's a lot of really stupid people in this world. We know there are, but you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> it, it, it seems like, Robert, you should, it, it seems like people are selling sand in Sahara, you know, in the desert. It's like, here, you can buy it because this is for free and it's happening right now. Yeah, well, 60, it, 69 million people voted for Donald Trump, too, in this yeah, election. Yeah. Can you imagine the level of stupidity that it takes to vote for this person? Mm -hmm. Either that or you're one of these evangelicals that's hoping that we'll have a nuclear war soon and they'll be raptured up and the rest of us will all die, the, the infidels. That's, that's who votes for Trump. Those so so I, 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 really, I really like your advice, Robert, what you say, snap out of it. Yeah, I think that that is the <laughs> best advice you could ever give. But somehow it's not possible to snap out of it until it snaps out of itself for some reason. And and uh, I think it helps to have someone yeah, help to so. have someone tell you you're hypnotized. Snap out of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. I think that does help. That's why I do it. But maybe it doesn't help. I, I can't prove it. But for some reason, the last weeks, it feels more, if I should talk about how it feels, it feels like everything is like ordinary, the same, but it's a lot easier because I don't have the baggage of what happens before and I don't have the future, what will come. And also other people in my, near me, I could free them from, from everything, their baggage also, because this is happening now. Yes. Have you seen it the same? I don't know about the same. I don't know about freeing other people, but it certainly feels. No, no. The fee my feeling is that I don't hold baggage for to other for other people. You oh, understand oh, that? No, yes. I, 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 yeah. I misunderstood. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's a lot easier to just deal with life one moment at a time. It really. Yeah. Is. For sure. And so sure. that's, that's a relief. If you can get into that frame of mind, that's a relief. It feels good. Yeah, I like it. It's like, but, but then the next thought come, maybe what if I lose it? But how could I lose it if it's here right now? It's not possible to lose it. 
Not right now. No, no. It's not possible to lose it right now. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, that's good. And, and yeah, this is what's happening. No, so that, that was the, the question was really like somehow I see that other other spiritual people are still very interested in money and even they talk about no self and stuff like that. But anyway, somehow the, the non-self wanna have a lot wanna have money. So I guess Yes, that's the point that's that's the the observation that needs to be remembered. Mm. If you look at these people who are talking. I don't mean the ones on Facebook who just social media has, you know, anybody can just get on there and rant and rave. I'm talking, yeah, about, yeah. The one, I'm talking about the ones with the careers, the names you know. Yeah. I used, I used yeah. to call these people out by name, but I don't anymore. Um, I don't, I get too much pushback. It's not worth it. No, no. <laughs> but these people, these people who have careers, you know their name, they have followers and all that. That's a corrupted industry. It's as corrupt as, as any other big business. It's a big business. Yeah. They're making a lot of money. There's millions of dollars involved in, in each one of these situations where you know the, the person's name. People yeah. buy those video, the, the videos, the books, they attend the conferences, they make donations. They, it's, it's really a, a corrupted situation because a conversation mm -hmm. like this is is just a normal conversation two people who sit on a park bench should, would can talk like this you don't ask someone to pay you for telling them the truth no, no. why i had a career talking to people Garn, so i really understand this i was a psychotherapist people came to my office talked to me for an hour and gave me money on the way out and that was fine. I was performing a service. And you could argue that being a spiritual teacher is a service and you should get paid for it in that way. But I don't believe that. I believe that if you have some essential truth about reality and you really believe you have it, you should spill the beans right away. Mm -hmm. don't, don't drag it out. Tell us what it is. If you need to write a book and sell the book for a few bucks, great. Write the book, sell it done with it. But no, with these people, let me just finish this thought now that I'm on a roll. What these people claim is that they have the power to reach out to you and awaken you. And they don't. They just don't. In my view, in my opinion, no one has that power. They have the power of hypnosis. Yeah, for sure. They can hypnotize you and make you feel that you are enlightened. But to actually, for you to really understand, no, no one has the power to make you understand. You have to, you understand what you understand when you understand it, not when somebody gives you the understanding. If you take it that way, Somebody gave me this understanding. There's no self, nothing is real, consciousness, God, love, all this. Those will be words in your mind, but you, you'll have a restless heart. The only thing that will actually soothe your heart is when you see things more as they are, which is I'm here. I don't know how I got here. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know if there is a why. I don't know what, what any of this is. I, I'm an animal. I know I am an animal because I have to shit in the morning just like any other animal. And but what do I make of that? You see, and that's that's truth. I don't know it's truth. Not blah blah blah. God, love, and all of that. That's not truth. It's bullshit. I say, in my yeah. humble opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Just the, the, fine, the final question, Robert, do you think that it's too ordinary? Is it why people are like missing it? Absolutely. That's it right yeah. there. That's it right there. 
I'm a, I'm a, mar a married guy living in a house. I've got grandchildren and that's life. Yes, not this other, this other crazy story. No. That, there's this, you know, they've got this dream. They go through life dreaming of enlightenment and pet masters yeah. and it's, it doesn't apply. Just it's not possible when it's happening now. It's happening now. How, how could it be possible that it would, I would be enlightened later? Yes, well, I think you have a good understanding of this now. And so you can just let the whole thing drop. Yeah, because, and also that's what I, why, I, why I figured the group should be for seven, seven weeks in a row. And I thought, why, why should I be there? Because this is it. How, how could I evolve during seven weeks? when it's happening now, yeah, it's not possible. Well, you know, actually I, I see that there's only a few of us here, four or five people. I'm surprised at that, but actually gratifying. It, what it means to me is that anybody who wanted to imbibe my point of view here has already done it and they don't need to follow Robert. You don't need to follow Robert. Robert's just another guy. Yeah. That's the way it is. <laughs> But a good guy. I like the robot. I will. I, I do too. I think he's a pretty good guy. But, you know, there's a lot of good guys in this world. That's the truth. Lots. Yeah. For the answers. Thank you. And thank you for doing it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Yeah, for me too. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we hear you. Great. Hi, Robert. Hi, everyone. Um, Robert, it's a real uh, pleasure to be able to speak with you. I've um, been watching on YouTube for a while. It feels a bit surreal to be actually speaking to you in person. Um, and I've read your books both a couple of times and really got a lot out of them and enjoyed them. I found them really kind of bracing and cut through a lot of BS. And uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I found, um, I guess, you in a kind of long line, really a long, you know, kind of ancient line of, uh, of rare people that have kind of had that sort of message. And I think I'd kind of come to something similar through my own explorations. Um, I, I was raised as a, well, I grew up in a family that was a evangelical Christian family and I didn't have any belief. I didn't believe it. I never believed it. Maybe in that sense, I was lucky. Um, but I grew up not believing that. And I went through various other sort of manifestations or iterations through my life, you know, got into Zen Buddhism when I was an adolescent and then uh, a bit more into Buddhism. And then I finally found my way to Taoism. Um, Taoism was something I kind of stuck with. It felt like something that had a flavor that I really loved and appreciated. But eventually studying that, if you like, and thinking about it and practicing it brought me to the, the I think essentially the same message that you're offering really, the, the early proto Taoists like Zhuangzi, they were kind of saying that there's just emptiness, you know, you're kind of empty and you can just, you know, be what you are and you can't be anything other than what you are. You might as well just crack on and, and, and make the most of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got so many questions I could ask um, and I'll only ask the one. I'm not on Facebook, so I've not had an opportunity to, to kind of submit other questions to. So uh, there's a hundred questions I could, I could really go down. I think one that interests me particularly um, as a fellow uh, psychotherapist. Uh, so if I can talk shop with you very briefly, um, with your psychotherapy hat on, um, I'm really interested in what you might have to say uh, and hear you just riff really on what are the areas of overlap, if anything, between these two domains, because I've spent my, my life kind of interested in psychology and psychotherapy. I've trained, I've been through a long psychoanalysis, intensive psychoanalysis. And on the other hand, I've been very interested in essentially this message we're talking about today, you know, not necessarily what you call a quote unquote spiritual message, but this idea of awakeness and aliveness um, and acceptance. Mm -hmm. I feel like obviously there's a long history of uh, thinkers. Alan Watts comes to mind. I know somebody we would both appreciate wrote a book called um, Psychotherapy East and West very much kind of thinking about the areas of overlap in the conversations and the dialogue that can happen between the field of psychotherapy and uh, and and so-called spirituality whatever eastern thought wisdom um and i'm just really interested in the, in these two areas and whether there can be a dialogue a useful dialogue between them whether they have anything to say to each other um just really be interested to hear your thoughts on that mm, yeah that's a good question 
Um, some people I've discussed this with, John Tollefson is an example. She sees this as a continuum. There's psychotherapy, and then when you kind of get to the end of that, then now you're in the, the into the spirituality thing, right? I don't see that. Um, I think that psychotherapy has more to learn from uh, neuroscience than it does from so-called spirituality, a lot more. And I think that in the next 20 or 30 years, um, we're going to find out how to treat mental illness, not so much by talking therapy, but by um, devices that people can use to change their intention so that there's not anxiety or there's not this feeling of schizophrenia where voices seem to be directing. I think that th there's going to be progress there. As I'm not an expert, as I just read, but as I understand this, um, the kind of psychoanalysis that you went through, I went through one too um, in my training. Um, it's kind of like spirituality in a way. And it's good for you, I think. If you're not obsessed, you have to be obsessed for a bit while you're doing it. But if you can let that kind of slide <laughs> after you've seen seen the territory, you know, you okay, <laughs> yeah. If you can do that, it's kind of like a spiritual experience. I th I think you know, especially if you're speaking with a really bright person who knows how to do the job, you know, they can help you. So. The, I'm kind of down on spirituality. I guess everyone knows that by now. But I don't mean that I'm down on these subtle experiences. I value them. I just don't think that blathering on about metaphysics is the way to induce those experiences. I think it hypnotizes people and keeps them from having the experiences. Because the experience might not involve God you see this, or love, you see the experience might be very different from either one of those things that that people, spiritual people are always talking about as if that's just true, because they say it is. Maybe a spiritual experience comes out of a deep despair. Who knows? So, but if I said, if I said, we're going to have a workshop next week on despair. Everybody's going to leave really bummed out and feeling that life is tragic. Pay me. I think I'd probably go broke, but if I say I'm going to teach you to be enlightened and love everyone, and you'll live forever, that's probably a good business. And that's how I regard that. As, on, as far as Taoism is concerned, that was really my last stop also <laughs> and then and it's beautiful and the, you know all of these traditions have something they're not they're not devoid but there comes a time in a fortunate life where you're just living it really it's really that simple i i can't teach this i just wake up in the morning and deal with the world as i have to there's nothing else. That's, that's all I can do. Yeah, I could have some philosophical ideas and all that, and it might influence me in one way or another, but it's not going to change the basic setup. The basic setup is if you wake up and you feel well, you can just get up and go about your day. If you wake up and you feel a terrible chest pain, the whole day is reprogrammed into something. Now, now there's going to be the emergency room and whatever. That's life. That's my life. I've been in both those situations and a lot of others. I've been in a situation of just bliss. And I, I could sit there and go, oh, wow, what a world. I just love this. And I've also been in deep grief and sadness. And it's not the same. So when these spiritual teachers 
are always lecturing about how nothing is really happening and it's all the same. I just, I'm aghast. I just look at them and I think, really, that's your life? That's really, really, it's all the same? I don't know, I mean, what kind of life is that? Where everything is all the same, nothing matters. Um, you don't really exist. Um, nothing ever happened. You know, nothing ever will happen. You know, all of this. Well, that may be true on some cosmic level. I have no way of assessing it, but that's not my experience. My experience is if I see a pretty girl in the street, I feel elated. Maybe only a little, I'm getting pretty old now, but it's still there. <laughs> and see, that's my experience. If I see someone abusing a child, I feel angry and feel like intervening. I don't just say, oh, well, it's all the same, it's nothing. I can't. So that's my personal confession, Nigel. Mm. Great, thank you, yeah. No, I, I really yeah, appreciate that. And I, I, that was my experience really after that, a long analysis was of having something like a, a realization which was very similar to what somebody else might experience as, a, as an awakening moment, really. It was almost like I had to go through a, a whole lot of trying to be something to have somebody really finally show me that like I couldn't be anything other than what I was in, in, in any moment. Yeah. So why was I putting so much effort to really notice I was putting so much energy and effort into trying to make reality conform to something that it wasn't? Yeah. You know, just to realize that. Yes. Yeah, so it was that, a, bolt, a bolt from the blue, and that came through a psychoanalysis. I think it got me to a very similar place to finally going, okay, this is it. Great. Acceptance. Uh, yes. That's, well, I think some of the power comes from looking at sides of oneself that you might normally suppress and not want to look at and they may not even be available to you unless you have a helper, a trained helper. But when you see them and you still survive, that's a relief. Yeah, I kind of messed up in this way and that way, and I've been hurt this way and that way, and it still has its sequelae in the present and all that. But hey, I'm, you know, I'm jumping Jack Flash. It's a gas, as the Rolling Stones put it. That's what that song's about. I was born in hellfire and all this, and but it's okay now. Jumping Jack Flash. See, I think that is what some of my therapy clients got from the time they spent with me. Tears were shed. Anguish came into the room. The injustice of it all was exposed, all of this. But at the end, they went out feeling it's okay. I have a perfect right to be here. I can be here. I'm not guilty. And I think that's what we learn from a good psychoanalysis or a good psychotherapy. It's not my fault. Things are as they are. I'm not, I'm not a bad person. And if that can extend into I'm not the doer, then that's this that's this because you know people look at me as kind of like Robert's awake but all it is really is I know that I'm not doing this and so I just relax and let the words come when I speak when I cook I just chop see it's that's what all the Zen people are always talking about except I don't practice this I just it just happens the the, the mind that takes credit isn't there it's just not there it's, so whatever I have, whatever I find myself doing, I just do it. Sort it out later. Yeah, I think the beauty is that that that, that seems there's like a radical kind of democracy to that. Everybody can access that potentially. Oh, well, there's, a, there's a there's a, a sort of radical democracy. It's kind of like an access all areas to to anybody potentially, whether you're on the whether you're fully awake or you see yourself as awake. There's a passage in in Zhuangzi where Confucius is sort of saying he's talking about people that who you know who might uh have been like you if you like at that time seen as being wandering i think it's called something like wandering beyond the ordinary bounds you know of the confucian world they're just outside of the ordinary kind of what's right what's wrong they don't make distinctions they don't they don't make they don't have those distinctions they just accept 
And Confucius kind of says, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a victim of heaven. And that's a kind of that's a really important passage, I think, because he kind of realizes that he's a victim of heaven. He, he's just not built like that. He can't do it. But then he accepts that he can't. And in that acceptance, he's kind of opening up to something. It's always available if you want to kind of accept your limitations wherever you are, wh whatever you're struggling with. And you can kind of face what you're experiencing. You don't have a choice in a way. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a really good point. Um, and yes, that philosophical tradition has run through um, centuries of human thought and it's always there. And it's what I call naturalism. Um, I am the way I am, I didn't make it. And all I can do is, I can't stop it either. There's no way to actually um, stop anything. We, we wish there were because we find ourselves doing things that make us feel guilty or ashamed or... Um, years ago, this um, disturbed guy went to the top of a tower in university in Texas with a rifle and just started killing people. He killed a lot of people because he was at, at the, high up and they, they couldn't really, cops couldn't get to him. He killed, I don't know how many people, 20 or 30 people, something, maybe, maybe, maybe 15 or 20 people, I don't know. Um, well, they eventually um, killed him. And when they did an autopsy, they found out that he had a brain tumor. And then when they investigated, he had a diary that he was keeping. And uh, he said, I need someone to stop me. So you see, this is, we're all driven like this, except since our behavior is an extreme, we don't have to say we're driven. We can say, I chose that. But I don't really do, th I don't really think there's much choosing going on. I think there's self-expression going on. And I think the thing that I bring to the party at this point, and it's not spirituality, it is not, I really isn't. There are, there, there are reference to it, in, there are reference, reference with a T to it in spirituality, references to it, but it isn't spiritual. It's no choice. It's just no choice. So this is what you were saying. Did you say Aristotle? Um, Zhuangzi. Oh, Zhuangzi. Yeah. yeah, Zhuangzi. Yeah, um, yeah well, he was, he's um, one of my influences. Um, I like this bit where he says, I feel so muddled. And it's hard for me to imagine that the other men aren't equally muddled. <laughs> how could that be? Well, that's kind of how I see it too. <laughs> that's pretty much, I see myself, I see my drives, I see my behaviors. I'm not proud of all of them, et cetera, et cetera. And I just see all these other people are so sweet and, you know, they're politically correct and everything and they wouldn't harm a fly. And I realized, mm -hmm. Really? I'm just this one fucked up guy and all, all of you are really so spiritual. And that, that's well, a huge weight off your shoulders, isn't it? Tremendous, <laughs> tremendous because it's okay to be. And if I say this to people all the time, if you insult someone or make a mistake, it's really simple. Just go to the person and say, I'm so sorry. That was not my intention. It just happened. I didn't mean it, and that will be true. See, that will be true. That's the thing you have to know about apologizing. When you do it, you're not saying I had an alternative. You're saying, I'm sorry this happened to you. I'm sorry that my being impinged upon you in a wrong way, and you really are sorry. But if, if the same circumstances arose, the same thing would happen. That's the, that's the problem. Yeah. What more do you have to say? Uh, I could go on and on. I won't take up too much more time. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I love what you're saying there. It does remind me a little bit of something that uh, Terence McKenna used to say about one of his uh, one of his trips, where he was. I think he was told by like the voice of the mushroom. He would talk about the voice of the mushroom talking to him. And one of the things that it said to him, he would ask it questions. He would say, "Well, come up and sit down, like pull up a chair, and I'd have a conversation." And that voice would say to him, "The idea of seeking one person seeking enlightenment from another is like one grain of sand seeking enlightenment from another grain of sand." I, can you see me now? Yes. Yeah. I see you. Hi. Hello. I, I have a question. Um, I really am starting to like you a lot. Um, for a long time, it hurt me because I felt that I was getting something from spiritual talks and that you were debunking them. And now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the things you are saying myself when I hear spiritual talks. Basically, how do you know? You know, how do you know? But I wanted to tell you my history. I started TM. I was not a seeker. I grew up in an atheist household. And I started in spite of the idea that there was spirituality involved, not because of it. And um, I had such a profound experience when I started TM. It, it just, from the first meditation, my whole reality changed. I went from spontaneously disagreeing with everybody to spontaneously agreeing. I felt inside myself there was this resonance with everything and everyone, and it was so different than my life had been before. And then of course I became open to listening to all the teachers because I was so moved by this experience I was having. But I, I just wondered where, you're, where what you are saying fits in with my experience of that TM actually did have a profound effect on my life, you know, changing my perspective and my inner experience. I basically have a sense of well-being all the time not that I don't have ups and downs and I get angry and I get hurt and everything you mentioned, you know, and I can't always control the things I want to control. I'm an overeater, a big overeater, you know, but underneath, underlying all that, there's some kind of basic sense of well-being, which never used to be there before I started to end. I used to have an empty hole. I was so lonely. I would cry myself to sleep every night if I didn't have a boyfriend. And then once I started to end, that was gone and there was a fullness in there. So anyway, I wonder where your perspective fits in with that experience. Um, I don't think that my comments are as powerful in your mind as your direct experience. Oh, of course not. Well, nothing so is. That pretty much. That's right. So that pretty much. That pretty much says it. I'm just expressing one human being's point of view. Some people have found it helpful. Other people think I'm the devil. So that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm just expressing how I see this. Um, and well, I, I, I came to some prominence because I wrote a book, two of them now, that, that people found influential and helpful. But that doesn't mean that the book is filled with truth. It's all an ex self-expression. So if you have an experience that doesn't seem to fit into Robert's worldview, mazel tov. I mean, that's great. You know, I don't want everybody to be like me and see things the way I, I see them. I want to express the way that I, that I see things. And just as other people's words in the past have been helpful to me, I think my words now are helpful to other people, but it's it's no big deal. Well, many of the things you say, in fact, are helpful to me, even though I've had that experience. Okay. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't nullify the things you're saying. There's a lot of things you're saying that uh, totally thrill me. I love the one about the good business model where you pay me now, and <laughs> in the future you'll get something. That's fabulous. Yeah. And, yeah. And the whole thing about not knowing. I mean, now when I listen to spiritual teachers, I'm thinking, well, how do you know? <laughs> you know? How do you know? That's really what I think now. And I think it's because I've read your books and I've listened to you, oh, David. So you. even though at first it was jarring to me, it really entered my awareness as something very valid and real. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I like hearing that. I think, yeah. that, I think that the most important thing that I have had to share that people have picked up on is when somebody makes a statement 
about whatever. It could be politics, it could be religion, whatever. The greatest question is, and you know that how. Mm -hmm. And if we really just apply that to everything and don't imagine that there are experts who really know the truth of everything and can teach it to you, but they just have their human point of view. Mm -hmm. It may correspond to something real. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But when they speak with this cert certitude, absolute certainty, I've got the truth and I'm going to, and then I say, really? How? Where'd you get that from? Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's 3,000 years old. That it must be true. See? <laughs> right. Well, th thank you for um, being here. Thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Anything? I see you, Roseanne, raising a hand. Is David, are you still there? Uh, yes, I'm still here. Um, Roseanne spoke before. I don't know if she has anything else. She can, no, uh, that was earlier that she had raised her hand. She, she's already spoken. No, I have not spoken. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead, Roseanne. OK, thank you. Thank you, Robert, very much for this meeting. Appreciate it. I've appreciated your books very much. Um, I have kind of a, I, I have a, a, a question of a personal nature and then an, another question for you. I think I'll just ask my general question first. Uh, and that is, do you have an opinion about David Hawkins, who is known for his very detailed mapping of consciousness? Are you aware of him? I'm not. No, I'm not. Okay, well, I, I, I'll ask you my next question. I had written you before on Facebook briefly um, that I studied A Course in Miracles for the past five years. Ah. And um, it's, it's, been, it's been a journey finding and reading your book and shifting out of that, a very big one for me, a huge shift, actually. And I just want to give you like a little background. It's interesting because I, in, in my studies of the course, I found myself seeking outside of it um, in, in some ways that the other participants weren't doing. And in that seeking, I found Tim Freak. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. You did a video with him. Yes, Tim Freak. Yeah. yeah. And he, you know, he has some different um, theories of consciousness. Uh, not so he he doesn't believe in the fall from grace uh, and sin that we all that 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 non-duality uh, speaks of. He he describes it more as a growing into consciousness, moving moving up, becoming more aware, and and um, he's got various theories around that. Um, and I, I bring that up because at the time I was studying the course. That was too much for me, even, you know, that was like, oh, what's he talking about? That's way out of my non-duality uh, theories, and I, I can't quite follow him there, so I'm going to stop listening to him. And I did for a few weeks, <laughs> and then I found myself searching outside the course again, and I went back to YouTube because he had a new video, and it was with you, and I thought, well, there's an interesting looking person. I just thought of you. I'm going to listen to the video. And shortly after you began speaking, I got it immediately. I, and I, I bring this up because I find it interesting that Tim, some of Tim's theories put a little bit of fear in me and, and sent me looking in another direction. But when I finally heard someone like you explain it the way you do, this is hypnotic. These aren't our thoughts. Who's to say that there's this God that's controlling all of us? It made sense. And having gone through that, what I find now um, is that I made a huge shift, it seemed like I made a huge shift to the other side of the pendulum and I can't quite get back. <laughs> I can't find a balance in the middle. I'm feeling somewhat 
nihilistic about it all. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and I'm sure that other people have gone through that. I guess I wanted some um, feedback from you about that. Yeah, I think that's a common experience. Was compared to jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. You, the, the bad news is you're falling forever and there's nothing to grab onto. But the good news, he said, is there's no ground. See, I don't think it's a pendulum and you get back to the middle. I think it's the boat sailed away from the dock now. It's been moored all its life. Someone untied the rope, the wind caught the sail, and now the boat's on the open sea. And there is no security there, and it is frightening. When you admit that anything could happen at any moment, say medically, one little tube in your head blows up and you're not yourself anymore. You might not even be alive anymore. It's very comforting to have a course in miracles that tells you this is all part of God's plan. And if you just think right, you'll understand and all your anxieties will go away. That's very comforting. And a lot of people enjoy that comfort and remain in that box for their entire lives. And some people don't. Now, I don't take any blame <laughs> for your experience on watching me and Tim freak. But if, <laughs> but if it was something I said that untied the rope, well, it, that's, that's what happened. But it's not my doing. I just talk. And I'm not trying to untie anyone's rope either. I, I don't want that responsibility. I mean, if someone, I have friends who are deeply religious, if you can believe that, and we get along great. And it's not that I hide my point of view, but I respect theirs. If it works for them, great. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of their way of thinking. It's just that I have to comment on, on the way I see things. I, I've just come to that in life. I wasn't always like this. I spent 20 years with these ideas silently, not talking to anyone about them. I wasn't prepared to discuss it. But now I am, and since I'm coming to the end of my life, this is a good time. So it's that's all. But whatever you have to go through is yours. And The Course of Miracles, in my opinion, is a really good book to discard. There's no, there's no truth in it. It's manipulation and it, it's a scam. This is all my opinion. It's a scam because Shackman, is that how you say her name? The writer of the original course, Shackman. Mm -hmm. She, in my opinion, as I understand, but I'm seeing it from distant, I could be wrong picked up on some very basic ideas from Vedanta about non-duality and transcribed them, she says, dictated to her by Jesus or whatever the story is. Come on, come on. He made a million bucks on that book, more, a lot more. And you've got all these followers that pay for courses and all the rest of this. It's terrible. It's, it's, in my view, entirely corrupt and it's not true. So you are now, in my, from my point of view, I don't know how you feel, but I see you as being liberated from all that. I feel that way. Beautiful. Yeah, I do. And I'm saddened because I've actually had conversations with other members of the group who will acknowledge that we don't know if any of this is true, but they choose to believe it because it, it brings peace to their lives. So I could never discuss this with them. They would never, for all their open-mindedness uh, or professing to be, they would never be able to understand my point of view here. I've lost a lot of friends. Um, you know, because I just know they, they're not ready to go there or something. I don't know. They, they won't hear this 
like I do. I, I have a friend from Peru. She's a little older than me. She's maybe 80. She's um, a Quechua Indian who grew up in the high mountains of Peru and had a total Christian indoctrination. Never heard any other ideas while she was growing up because it's very isolated up there. It was anyway, 80 years ago. And I guess it isn't anymore. And um, she has this profound faith in the Christian message and that Jesus is her savior and she will be with him in heaven and all the rest of it. And she is con really convinced of this. She has no doubt of it that I can ever no notice anyway. And she's profoundly peaceful. She takes life as kind of the waiting room and she has to do her best, but none of this is really, it's, we haven't gotten to the real story yet. The real story happens after the test. This is, the, this is like the schoolroom here. And then you don't sin, you learn to tame your sinful nature or whatever it is, and then you're with Jesus and everything's cool. She believes that. I wouldn't try to talk her out of it. First of all, I don't know that it's not true. To me, it seems strange, but how do I know? I mean, you know, it could be. I could be a fairy at the, at the foot of the garden, you know, I don't see it, but so um, that's, I can't criticize it because I don't really know. But the other thing is I would never take that away from her because she's so, so beautiful with it, but I consider it, it, it a hypnotic trance in the sense that it, it was induced by repetition and by hymns and by gold fi finery and, and men with strange hats waving bizarre implements and all the rest of it. See, that that's a hypnotic trance. That's not a, a really, um, and you know that how. See. And, yeah. and you know that how is the essential question in, in, from my point of view, because I want to live this life with my eyes open. I don't want comfort. I really don't. I, I found that I don't need it. I really don't. If I grieve, I have, I have done. I, I can do it. It's terribly hard. <laughs> it breaks your heart but I'm still here. I don't need God for anything. I don't know that such an entity exists, but I don't need to believe in it to feel okay. And that when I say I'm awake and liberated, that's exactly what I mean. I don't need some secondhand knowledge injected into my mind in order to cope with being here, being human. And that's all, that's all it is. When I say I'm awake, people imagine this grandiose thing, oh, you've conquered all suffering and all the rest of it. No, that, that's not it at all. I'm just free to be human. Well, um, just as a last, last quick question, speaking of seeking, as a couple of folks have brought up here as well, Mm -hmm. that we have an urge to seek. Uh, I heard you on a video speak of Peter Zapfi. Yes. So I read up a bit on him mm -hmm. and I find that a fascinating theory and a very, what could be a very valid one. Could you give your opinion on that? Uh, that we humans have evolved our brains to a point, our brains have evolved to a point where we just do seek um, when there's nothing really to be sought, but it's a kind of evolution that, you know, beyond your, your common dog. Yeah, um, that's a, that's, thank you, Carol. That's a great question um, for me because I, I really love discovering Peter Zapfa. Um, a few years ago, when I was more than a few now, but when it was, he was such a kindred spirit. I mean, I, I thought, my God, this guy, this is, this is pretty much how I see it, too. This is kind of amazing that this guy laid it out, and he's a well-known philosopher and all the rest of it. Um, 
Basically, his idea was this, the fact that our lives are limited, that we see death fills us with anxiety and we can't, we don't have the intelligence to figure any of this out. So we either distract ourselves with sex and all this, or we attach ourselves to some grand organization. I'm the president of the United States. I'm really important. That would be one. Um, or, or we um, can engage in um, creative acts that are, lend meaning to this apparently meaningless existence that we're involved in. That was Zapfa, and that's pretty much the way I see it, including I, I'm a bit of an artist, and I understand that my work is a kind of compensation for having to be alive and die, you know, and all that, kind of take it that way. Here, I can do this beautiful thing while I'm here anyway. And even what I'm doing here now, it's, this is my way of coping with the fact that I'm this old guy and I'm looking at the end coming up at me. And it feels good to be relevant, to just people want to hear what I have to say, read my books. That's kind of a Zapfa-esque escape hatch. And I think that's what we've got. <laughs> I think that's we. And so th that that's my attitude to, to, to go the full circle. That's my attitude toward the Course in Miracles. To me, it's a bizarre scam. But if someone can really be OK in life because they believe it and they really believe it, who am I to take that away? I'm, I've got my own compensations and things that I rely on. Yes, we all do. That, and that's that's why I, the, the thing that I keep reiterating in my books and in my personal expression, we're all just human here. There's no great, great masters. That's a, that's a fantasy. There's no great masters. We all, we're all human. There are wise people. There are people who are wise in the ways of living or philosophically. Yes, that exists but they haven't mastered anything. They have to have their compensations. They have a human mind. And the human mind is the mind that Zapfa was talking about. It feels anxiety because it knows enough to know that it's going to die. It knows that much and it can't fix it. So it finds ways. Religion is one of those ways. Religion and spirituality are one of those ways of coping. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll is another one. That's just, that's, yes, that's the world. Yes, and I think the knowledge that we are going to die is what motivates behavior. Absolutely. That's yeah. it. That's, the, that's the, the primary source of anxiety that we all, the sword of Damocles is hanging right over your head at all times. We all know it. Everyone knows it. Some people say it doesn't matter because I'll be with God. If that, if they really believe that and it helps them through the whatever gets you through the night, that's my attitude. I, I really mean that. But that said, that won't shut me up. I won't say, well, then I mustn't speak of these matters because what if somebody who relies on it hears it? I used to feel that way for a time when I first started speaking out on this. It was difficult because I thought I might be hurting somebody, you know. And then I realized, no, not really, because if they're not ready to hear this, they won't hear it. They'll just say Robert's nuts. And that, you see, that, and that's, that's good. It's good to be crazy. <laughs> it's so liberating. Oh. Thank you so much. What a joy. It was so great speaking with you. Thank you so much. You know, I was you saying too. earlier, I pointed out earlier to Goran that when I was speaking to Alango, that was one conversation and I felt like one person. And when I spoke with Goran, that was a different conversation and I wasn't the same person anymore. And I've just had that experience with you again. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a tiny meeting, which has been great. The last time we did this, it was like 50 people and I, could, I couldn't get it organized and there was 
um, interruptions. And this has been great, uh, really beautiful. I feel like I'm actually meeting people and getting to uh, hear from them. So it's great. I don't know if there's anyone left who wants to speak. If there isn't, I'm gonna call an end to the meeting and just thank you all for being here. I see you, Burma, do you want to speak? Yes, I do, actually. Okay, hi. Hi, oh my gosh. I'm so glad that I lucked out and serendipitously this day turned into being able to be with everyone. I loved what you said in, in, for the last question. And I don't know why I take notes, you know, it's, I don't know, it just makes me feel like I'm, uh, I'm absorbing deep in a deeper way, but that's just a thought. I don't know. Well, no, I think there's good scientific evidence for that. Oh, great. Yes. That makes me feel even better. Um, recently, in the last year, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. I'm 77 years old, and I think about death a lot. It, it just is because my body is breaking down visibly and I know it and um, it's just one of those things um, and so even though I may look like smiley and happy inside sometimes I'm really terrified and uh, it's very hard it's it's a it's a hard diagnosis to receive um, and I have to rely on my husband so now he's becoming more a caregiver in certain ways because of things that I can't do. And so anyway, um, I, just, I just love this whole, this whole interaction with everyone who showed up. And um, I really, really appreciate you, Robert, because I don't know whether you un realize this or not, but you model aging for me so well. And, and I appreciate your candor and sharing your challenges as you age and how how hard it can be sometimes and yet you still have this beauty and presence that transcends those aspects and it just means it means a lot to me and uh, you know i you know, some people drink alcohol for consolation, but I go to you. <laughs> I know that sounds, but I go to you and um, your books and your, I don't do Facebook, but for some reason I can watch your Facebook videos. I'm allowed to do that somehow. So I, I skirt around it, but yeah. And, and this small group today is, um, really lovely it's it's like the old days way back when you first started uh doing these things these meetings and there weren't so many people and then eh, it goes in and out it's like a yo-yo goes up and down i guess but um yeah it's just you're a gift i i appreciate you so much i really just wanted to share that with you it's, yeah, very much. Well, it's very kind of you to say that, Burma. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry about the Parkinson's. That's a nasty diagnosis. Yeah, and it hit life, hard. It's life changing. Yeah, it definitely hit really hard. Yeah. 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 And I have a, a friend right here in Tala Santos who's also ill that way. So, you know, we talk about it sometimes. Yeah. I think it's just one moment at a time, one foot in front of another. Yeah, literally. Yes, well, that's what I mean, yeah. It's really difficult and I'm sorry. And I understand what you said about changing a relationship with your significant other. Yeah, it's hard to, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are no simple solutions. The, the thing that brings me the biggest relief is to just rest in not knowing and not having any answers. That, so 
somehow comforts me. It sounds counterintuitive, but to not have any answers is such a restful state for me. Well, it doesn't seem counterintuitive to me. It's okay to die. We all have to. And when we're not trying to get out of it, even though the way that it occurs might be not the one we would have chosen if we'd been given that choice. Right. But the, the same kind of thing has to happen to everyone one way or another. We all die. And right. so it's good to make peace with that if we can. Yeah. Well, I guess there's no one left who wants to speak. Is that a fact? It seems to be. I will now bid you all farewell and end the meeting. Be well, everyone.